I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do not care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> if you are one of these people who really believes that socialism can help you, I'm, uh, I'm about to pop your bubble here, and uh, I think you're going to uh, want to change your mind about that. That is, if you know you have any sense at all, and my uh, experience with socialists is that they usually don't. The uh, Swiss government is a socialist government. The government of uh, Switzerland has been held up to the world, ladies and gentlemen, as the great example of how well socialism really works. Well, it really doesn't work, and I'm about to tell you why. And I'm going to use Switzerland as the example why, just as they hold it up uh, uh, to you, as, uh, as an example of the utopian socialist state, I'm going to show you that, once again, they are liars. They are the worst, most chronic liars I have ever come across in my entire life or in my study of history. Even Hitler. Well, you can't say that because Hitler was a socialist. Nazi means National German Workers Socialist Party. National Socialist German Workers Party is uh, is what it means. Nazi, very simple. Hitler was a socialist. Nazis are socialists. Whatever you may have been brainwashed to believe, to the contrary, the truth is, Nazi is socialism. Hitler was a socialist. Hitler socialized Germany. The nation of Switzerland, ladies and gentlemen, has the highest suicide rate in the world. These are simple statistics that you can find anywhere. Switzerland has the highest rate of depression of any country in the world outside of what used to be known as the Soviet Union when it was at its height, when vodka was the largest selling commodity in that organization. Remember, socialism is just one step on the rung above communism. So here you have the highest suicide rate in the world, the highest rate of depression. This is the nation that the socialists hold up to you as a great example of how socialism works. Recently, the Wall Street Journal, on Monday the 24th of February, reported that the Swiss Army is now preparing for violent protests and is studying the Los Angeles riots. The article is Swiss Miss. Banks falter. Jobs are lost. <laughs> that's, that's the story of socialism. They have a negative, that's negative, minus, half a percent total growth. Now, this just isn't a minus a half percent growth for the last year. This is a minus a half percent total growth since 1990, the slowest in the entire industrialized world. Unemployment, they say, is over 5.7 percent. And uh, they will admit that about 10 percent of all of the Swiss citizens live below the poverty level. How about those statistics? What do you think about that? You know why it's so attractive not to work in Switzerland? Because the Swiss unemployment benefits are 80% of your previous salary for two years. Don't you think? I mean, with our experience with welfare here, once people get on these measly welfare checks, and I mean they're measly, barely live on them, they get addicted to it and can't get off and won't get, don't you think people are going to be tempted? not to work if they get 80% of their salary for the last two years on unemployment. Two years ago, there was a rally in Zurich protesting Swiss integration into the European Union. 
The government brought out riot police and water cannons. Last October, 15,000 farmers marched in Bern to protest cuts in agricultural subsidies. They were followed by 35,000 public employees protesting changes in work rules. <laughs> oh, boy. And they say that Switzerland is the great, uh, the great example for socialists to follow. Well, the Swiss Army believes that there's going to be serious civil unrest in Switzerland. And uh, they're trying to get the army into domestic policing. And it's just another example of a worldwide trend to merge civilian police and the military functions. Now, what kind of a flash do you think that's going to be? Because in Switzerland, everybody is required to own and possess, maintain and keep weapons and ammunition in every home. So if they do have civil unrest and they bring the military out against the citizens, you'll obviously see a serious war there. In any case, I wouldn't go to Switzerland on a vacation. How about you? Mm hmm? Well, folks, let's, uh, let's cause a great stir and a commotion throughout the land. I'm going to read you an article now from Guns Magazine, January 1995. I go back a couple of years to get this. Guns and the Law is the column by Roy Huntington. Everybody should have a copy of this. The Militia. A. The Militia of the United States consists of all able-bodied males at least 17 years of age, and except as provided in Section 13 of Title 32, under 45 years of age, who are or have made a declaration of intention to become a citizen of the United States. B. The classes of the militia are 1. The organized militia, which consists of National Guard and the Naval Militia, and 2. The unorganized militia, which consists of members of the militia who are not members of the National Guard or of the Naval Militia. Title 10, United States Code, Section 311. When uh, the president signed into law the Omnibus Crime Bill, he said during the ceremony, quote, it is up to you to take personal responsibility for your safety, end quote. I'm sorry? What did he just say? He takes away the very means we have to defend ourselves with one hand, then pleads he can't be responsible for our safety and to look out for ourselves with the other. It seems we have politicians who think for their own good and not for the people they represent. In fact, I know it. Since the crime bill has passed, I'm going to throw away my guns and take the locks off of all my doors and leave my keys in my cars. After all, there shouldn't be any more crime. Of course, I've also got a real deal on a bridge I have for sale in Brooklyn. Anybody interested? You can phone Connie during this broadcast. We'll make you a deal you can't refuse. But we did it to ourselves. Though politicians are so afraid to say no to anything with crime in the title for fear of being voted out by the sheeple that it tempers their objectivity. For the sheeple are so dazzled by all of the statistics that are skewed and swayed and uh, perverted in manners that serve certain agendas. that they literally are on their knees begging for their rights to be taken away to get the drugs and the crime off the streets. 
Have you been guilty of that? The American public has to grow up, ladies and gentlemen, and let representatives do their job. Just because propaganda for a new law says it will be tough on crime doesn't mean it is actually so. Just look at the omnibus crime bill, by the way, that they passed not just last year, but every year and each time they pass the omnibus crime bill, it's going to do away with all of the crime. And then the next year when they find out that it didn't, they want to pass another one. And they take away more and more of our rights. And it doesn't get anybody off the streets. And it certainly hasn't cut down on the use or the availability or the profit in drugs. Or has it stopped murders in places that you're not even allowed to own guns like Washington, D.C. and New York City? Which, by the way, have the highest crime rates in the entire free world. We must let an appropriately educated representative vote according to reason and not let knee-jerk anti-crime hysteria by the voting public get in their way of objective evaluation. That's what a republic is all about. You see, democracies cause what is happening. Still, let's make them pay for it. Let's make them pay for it. After the crime bill's initial failure in the House, we witnessed and were victim to a wholesale caustic verbal attack on the American people by President Clinton and his cronies. His public whining after the failure of the bill to go to the floor for a vote was inappropriate, at least, and certainly embarrassing conduct for the President of the United States of America, and all the while with that silly little smile, smirk on his face. As if he's sort of laughing at us all the time. And I believe sincerely that he is. His posturing in front of on-duty uniformed police under orders to pose as a backdrop for Clinton's speech, most against their will, was a flagrant abuse of his powers, using public servants for his own political maneuvering. As a working cop, I am very definitely prohibited against appearing in uniform while expressing my own political views. What gives him the right? He continues to affront the intelligence of the thinking man by assuming we know little or nothing of our country's history and have a short memory regarding his promises. His recent tirades have included implications that the Supreme Court of the United States has never directly dealt with the Second Amendment, and I'm going to put that to rest during these two hours, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, he has pointedly insulted millions of law-abiding Americans by telling us, in no uncertain terms, we don't know what is best for ourselves. He and his liberal peers have harangued us, pointedly telling us that by failing to encourage our elected officials to follow his edicts, we have foolishly ignored his more logical, just ask him, he'll tell you, albeit uninformed, biased, and politically motivated agendas, thereby endangering millions. His carefully orchestrated speeches while standing in front of uniformed officers, ladies and gentlemen, rank with the very best of the old propaganda thinkers. If you tell them it is so enough times, they will eventually believe it. Oh, but not the American people. <laughs> oh, you better think again. You see, I'm concerned. Too many of the American people I spoke with after the passage of the crime bill knew virtually nothing about the gun ban portion. Cop after cop knew it had something to do with assault rifles, but knew nothing of the specifics regarding magazine capacity. Many thought police officers would be exempt and were suitably huffed when I explained that they would not be. You see, police officers have an elitist attitude of their own, believing that they are above the public and should be exempt from the same laws that the public, of course, must abide by. Boy, were they upset when they found out that that wasn't true. It is truly our fault this has all come to pass. It is a product of our collective ignorance, apathy, and yes, even stupidity. 
and our collective laziness. Hard words indeed. It is important, ladies and gentlemen, to remember who we are dealing with. Recently, Senator Rockefeller said that he would railroad the health care bill through regardless of what the people wanted. Let me say that again in case you missed it. Regardless of what the people wanted. Whatever happened to by the people, for the people, and all of that nonsense. I feel compelled to once again show how Clinton has lied to the American people. It has become so mundane and regular as to be almost routine. You see, the Supreme Court has made many rulings regarding the Second Amendment. All protestations notwithstanding. And uh, I'm going to give you several of those right now. You might find it interesting to note, however, that the American Civil Liberties Union, the so-called defenders of your constitutional rights, and the bastion of all that is liberal, will not represent you when Janet Reno's brigades of thugs make an unlawful attack on your home and you are arrested on a trumped-up gun violation, which is constitutional. Un- constitutional on its face. I'm afraid the ACLU has arbitrarily decided the Second Amendment is null and void and not for today's world. In fact, the ACLU has publicly announced that they do not recognize the second article in amendment, yet they call upon all Americans to be law-abiding but they decide they will not recognize a portion of the supreme law of the land, making them outlaws. You see, they, they believe it's null and void, and not for today's world. Call and ask them if you don't believe it. They'll tell you. I wonder which unalienable right will fall next, since they all seem to be crumbling as rot attacks the very foundation they were built upon. Now I want you all to pay attention. Make sure you have pen and pencil by your side and if you don't, shame on you because you know that you should never listen to this broadcast without it. Listen carefully. Listen to what the United States judicial system says and remember, we fought the British for less than what is going on today. Much, much less. So much less But I think the colonists who fought the Revolutionary War might just have thoughts about our courage, questions about cowardice and such things like that. 1865 Presser versus Illinois. All citizens capable of bearing arms constitute the reserve militia, and the states cannot prohibit the people from keeping and bearing arms so as to disable the people from performing the militia duty to the general government. End quote. Let me read that again, you blithering bleeders. As you know that I'm not talking to all of you, if it makes you mad that I call you sheeple, then I'm talking directly to you because I've hit a nerve. And you know it's true or you wouldn't be upset about it. Any more than I would be upset walking down the street when somebody yells, Stop, robber! Because I know I didn't rob anybody. <laughs> 1865, Presser versus Illinois. Quote, All citizens capable of bearing arms constitute the reserve militia and the states cannot prohibit the people from keeping and bearing arms so as to disable the people from performing the militia duty to the general government, end quote. 1876, United States versus Cruikshank. Quote, The court said the people's right to bear arms, like the rights of assembly and petition, existed long before the Constitution and is not in any manner dependent upon that instrument for its existence, end quote. And I've told you that many times. The Constitution itself recognizes the militia as a pre-existing force. 1939, United States versus Miller. The court said, quote, 
The militia is comprised of all able-bodied males, adding that ordinarily when called, these men were expected to appear bearing arms supplied by themselves and of a kind in common use at the time. It also said that since there was no evidence that a sawed-off shotgun is an appropriate militia or military weapon, there is no constitutional right to possess such an instrument. The implication was clear that arms appropriate for the military are protected by the Second Amendment. These are the very firearms scheduled to be banned in the crime bill. And have been. 1990, United States versus Verdugo Urquidez. Quote, the term, the people, as explicitly used in the Second Amendment and elsewhere in the Constitution and Bill of Rights, is a term chosen by the Founding Fathers to mean all individuals who make up our national community, end quote. You see, these anti-gun people are lying, puke-faced pigs chronic liars. Everything that drips out of their mouth is a lie. 1943, Murdoch versus Pennsylvania. Quote, in a First Amendment case on religion and press, but important to the taxing and licensing of privately owned firearms, the court said that the power to impose a license fee on a constitutional right amounts to prior restraint and the power to restrict or deny the right. The court ruled it unconstitutional to require a license tax for exercise of a right guaranteed by the federal constitution. The court called the license fee a flat tax and said, a tax laid specifically on the exercise of these freedoms would be unconstitutional. End quote. And this is almost exactly what brought that first showdown at Lexington and Concord. I leave you with this little reminder from 1855, which has been upheld many times over in courts in our country. South versus Maryland. Quote, courts have repeatedly held that police have no duty to protect any individual, but only a general duty to protect society and cannot be held personally liable for failure to protect an individual. See also Warren versus District of Columbia, 1981. And even if they wanted to, in many cases they couldn't. Or a recent poll showed that approximately 50 to 60 percent of all calls for police help were not answered for over an hour. Clearly, each individual must assume responsibility for his own protection, along with the implications regarding the rights of ownership of the means to do so. If they tell us they can't, won't, and don't have to protect us, then take away the very means for us to take care of ourselves, it seems to me that it leaves us at their mercy. Do you really want to be at their mercy? Do you? I doubt, seriously, that you do. Now I'm going to read you the testimony of David Koppel to the FUMO Committee, Tuesday, February the 25th, 1997, at 8.56 p.m. I'm sorry, that's wrong. That's when I received this. I'm going to read the testimony to the FUMO Committee of David Koppel, folks, which occurred September the 8th, 1994. Or as soon as I read that date, I knew it was wrong. He testified to the Pennsylvania Legislature, to the Select Committee investigating the use of automatic and semi-automatic firearms in Philadelphia. David B. Koppel is the Research Director of the Independence Institute, Golden, Colorado. He is also an Associate Policy Analyst for the Cato Institute, Washington, D.C. And I'm going to read this verbatim with no interjections unless I tell you that I am going to interject something. Quote, Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am David B. Koppel, an associate policy analyst with the Cato Institute, a free market think tank in Washington, D.C. I am also the author of the book, The Samurai, The Mountie, and The Cowboy, Should America Adopt the Gun Controls of Other Democracies? 
The book was chosen as the book of the year by the American Society of Criminology's Division of International Criminology. Within the United States, there are few success stories available for gun control advocates. The areas with the most gun controls, such as New York City, which has severe gun licensing, or Washington, D.C., handgun prohibition, a ban on keeping an assembled long gun for self-defense, in other words, you can't own a gun, are also the areas with the most gun crime. While it is true that New York, Washington, Chicago, and other gun control centers would probably be dangerous places with or without gun controls, these restrictive jurisdictions are rarely looked to as models by anyone who does not live there. Accordingly, the American gun prohibition movement, including the medical researchers and physicians who support gun prohibition, often extol the virtues of other democratic nations such as Canada, Great Britain, or Japan. Those countries have strict gun control laws and little gun crime, argue the prohibitionists. If the United States adopted similar policies, the United States would enjoy a similar low rate of gun crime. To many advocates of restrictive firearms laws, the necessity of imitating foreign-style gun control laws is painfully obvious. But surprisingly, there has been little research into how these foreign gun laws work, if they work at all. Even gun prohibition advocates are rarely able to provide more than a paragraph or two of generalized assertions about gun laws in any particular country. So do foreign gun laws work, and would they work if imported into the United States? This was the question I set out to answer as I began research for my book, The Samurai, The Mountie, and The Cowboy, Should America Adopt the Gun Controls of Other Democracies, printed by Prometheus in Buffalo in 1992. After examining in depth the gun control policies of Japan, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Jamaica, and Switzerland, and the gun culture in the United States, it became clear that the foreign gun control situation is much more complex than American gun control advocates have assumed. Among the foreign countries, there is no particular correlation between the severity of gun control and the prevalence of gun crime. Indeed, of the nations studied, the two that are by far the safest have diametrically opposite gun control policies. In Japan, violent crime and homicide are virtually unknown, except for crimes perpetrated by the Yakuza gangsters and the murder of children by suicidal parents. Japan prohibits handguns and rifles. Shotguns may be obtained only after a rigorous licensing process that even includes a short psychiatric examination. The almost complete prohibition on guns in Japan has been strictly enforced ever since 19... Excuse me. <laughs> have been strictly enforced ever since 1588. That's right, 1588. When the military dictator... Hideyoshi announced the, quote, sword hunt, end quote, and confiscated all firearms and swords from the peasantry. Hideyoshi's decree perceptively observed that, quote, the possession of unnecessary implements makes difficult the collection of taxes and tends to foment uprising, end quote. <laughs> so at first glance, the Japanese experience would seem to support the theory that turning the possession of instruments of deadly force into a government monopoly will make people safer from each other, if not safer from the government. Only one other country examined in the Samurai, the Mountie, and the Cowboy has a murder rate as low as Japan. That country is Switzerland, where gun control laws are also strict, but in a rather different way. You see, Every Swiss male aged 20 to 50 is strictly required to spend several weeks a year in military training. Switzerland has no professional standing army and has always relied for defense on having its entire male population trained in warfare and ready to mobilize. As part of the militia duty, every militiaman, that is every male aged 20 to 50, is given a fully automatic assault rifle required to keep it in his home and obliged to periodically demonstrate his marksmanship proficiency. 
first policy makes the acquisition of other weapons simple for everyone, including women and men who are too old for military service. Ammunition sales are subsidized. 3,000 shooting ranges flourish in a nation two-thirds the size of West Virginia. Many long guns may be bought with no restrictions at all, whereas federal United States law requires all gun purchases to be registered at the point of sale. Most handguns and some rifles require a simple permit to purchase, which is given freely to any adult who is not a criminal, alcoholic, or otherwise disqualified. Even anti-tank weapons, howitzers, anti-aircraft guns, and cannons may be purchased with a readily and easily obtained license. Firearms, shooting competitions, and survival training pervade Swiss life in a way that would startle many suburban Americans who see guns mainly on television. And yet for all the machine guns and other weapons in Switzerland, the country is as safe as Japan and significantly safer than countries with much more restrictive gun control laws such as Great Britain or Australia. What Japan and Switzerland have in common, and what is conspicuously absent in most of the metropolitan United States, is a very strong family structure, tightly knit communities, stable residential patterns, and good relationships across generational lines. The crucial variable is not the presence of firearms, but the degree to which young people are successfully socialized into non-criminal responsible behavior patterns. The evidence from other nations is consistent with the Swiss-Japanese experience. At the turn of the century, Great Britain had no gun controls at all. Convicted violent felons, the criminally insane, and anyone else could buy and carry anything from a Derringer to a sawed-off shotgun to a Gatling gun with no registration and no licensing. The only requirement was ready cash, and yet Great Britain had almost no gun crime as the constraints imposed by the Victorian Code of Behavior provided the most effective gun control system the nation ever experienced. As the 20th century has progressed, laws in Britain have grown increasingly severe, so that only about 4% of households today legally own guns, and those households are subject to arbitrary inspections by a police force with the announced goal of eliminating civilian gun ownership and while Britain remains generally safer than the United States, violent crime and gun crime have skyrocketed compared to earlier decades. While Britain, in the name of public safety, has abolished or drastically constricted many rights that Americans take for granted, including the right to bear arms, the right to a criminal jury trial, the right to grand jury indictments, the right to a criminal jury trial, the right to a criminal defendant to confront his accuser, and, by the most recent government proposal, the right to silence. The concentration of ever greater power in the hands of the government has proven a poor antidote for the steady decline in the socialization of children into responsible behavior by the community. Although American gun prohibition advocates appear to endorse every foreign gun control law they encounter, there was only one gun law in the countless in the countries let me read that again so there's no confusion. Although American gun prohibition advocates appear to endorse every foreign gun control law they encounter, there was only one gun law in the country studied in the Samurai whose enactment led to any statistically noticeable drop in gun crime. In contrast, many of the foreign gun laws were associated with significant reductions in the gun suicide rate, although the evidence also suggests that the substitution of other methods of suicide wiped out any statistically perceptible net savings of lives. The one gun control law that was followed by a noticeable drop in crime was enacted in Jamaica, where a 1974 gun confiscation law was accompanied by numerous other repressive measures, including house-to-house -house searches, incommunicado detention, secret trials, mandatory life in prison for possession of a single bullet, warrantless searches and seizures, and military enforcement of the drug laws. The Jamaican violent crime rate dropped significantly for six months. 
then returned to its former level over the next year, and then began to grow substantially worse than it had ever been in its history. As the homicide rate soared far above American levels, about a third of all Jamaican homicides were perpetrated by the police. A Jamaican suffered a higher risk of being murdered by the police than an American did of being murdered by anyone. According to the human rights group, America's watch policemen would murder personal enemies and then falsely claim that the victims were killed in a shootout. Homicide perpetrated by the police were rarely investigated as long as the policeman claimed that the victim had a gun. The increasing police violence made possible in part by middle class hysteria over guns in turn fueled a cycle of violence in the rest of Jamaican society. Almost every scholar who has studied the Jamaican crime situation shares the conclusions of criminologist William Callaphy's award-winning analysis, which found that the gun restrictions, as well as the other restrictions on civil liberty, were the result of, quote, highly developed skills of political management, end quote, which were designed not to reduce crime, but to distract public attention from the underlying problems of Jamaican society, including economic inequality. Jamaica's experience with a soaring rate of murder by government would not be particularly surprising to many American or Australian gun owners. In the United States and Australia, many gun owners view the fundamental purpose of the right to bear arms to be resistance to a tyrannical government. Most gun owners in Great Britain, Canada, and New Zealand, though, would kid their American and Australian cousins for placing guns in the context of of resistance to authority rather than innocent sporting purposes. The Jamaican experience is perhaps the most important foreign gun control situation for Americans to study, not because there is any realistic possibility of similar laws being imposed in the United States, at least not all at once, but because Jamaica illustrates the political distraction function of gun control. Politicians in Great Britain and Canada have successfully used gun control to turn attention away from proposals to reinst reinstatement of the death penalty after highly publicized shootings. While many tepid supporters of American gun control acknowledge that gun control may not accomplish much, they hope that it might accomplish a little and reason that since gun control can't hurt, it is worth trying even for minimal gain. Gun control opponents counter that gun control kills because, at least sometimes, it deprives innocent persons of the ability to protect themselves. While such an objection may be a relatively potent response to the stated goal of Handgun Control Incorporated, Chair Sarah Brady, the prohibition of the ownership of any firearm for self-defense, the objection is less relevant to lesser gun control proposals which have a smaller impact on self-defense. The more immediate risk of so many gun control proposals in the United States is their political distraction function. As long as the American public tolerates politicians touting gun control as the top item on the public safety agenda, then politicians will continue to evade the difficult job of enacting measures that would deal with the roots of America's crime crises, including a welfare system that subsidizes illegitimacy in fatherless children, a dysfunctional government school system in most large cities, a rapidly growing underclass of all races, tax policies which prevent many mothers from choosing to stay home with their children, and a failed and counterproductive war on drugs. Yet as more and more criminologists come to recognize most of the gun control lobby's agenda as a distraction from meaningful social reform, the Centers for Disease Control and other segments of the medical establishment churn out reports which insist that gun ownership is a public health problem, at least in regards to comparisons of the United States with other nations, the reports are far from persuasive. Sometimes the medical research compiles genuinely useful international data, but then contends itself with asserting that gun control must be good because the American gun crime rate is so much higher than in other countries. In other cases, as in the famous Seattle-Vancouver studies, the media 
turn a journal's press release soundbite into a conclusion, which vastly overstates the inferences that can be drawn from a single case study, especially when the research is seriously flawed as the Seattle-Vancouver work. Among the limitations of the Seattle-Vancouver studies is, consistent with virtually all research regarding Canada, the absence of any perceptible beneficial effect from Canada's switch in 1977 from a system of no regulation for long guns and mild regulation for handguns to moderate regulation for long guns and stringent regulation for handguns. In contrast, epidemiological or criminological research which questions the efficacy of gun control including a study of all Canadian provinces and adjacent American states, rarely receive much attention beyond academia. Finally, the public health campaign to outlaw guns because of the allegedly successful gun control policies of other nations ignores the potential criminogenic effect of those controls. American rates for crimes that usually involve guns, such as murder, and crimes that rarely involve guns, such as rape, are both far higher than the rates in most democratic nations. Curiously, the American residential burglary rate is below that of other nations. Perhaps this is because in the United States, an American burglar who breaks into an occupied home faces a risk of being shot that equals his risk of going to prison. In contrast, burglars in other nations do not face such risks. Gun owners in Great Britain, New Zealand, and Canada express little interest in the protective aspects of gun ownership. Australians are more interested in guns for protection, but as a matter of law, defensive gun ownership is illegal in most of Australia. Given the poor record of restrictive firearms laws in other English-speaking countries, the simplistic, reflexive insistence of the gun prohibition lobby and its medical allies that the United States immediately import foreign gun control laws may imperil rather than protect public health. And uh, that is the opinion and the research of David B. Koppel, which is significant and overwhelmingly shows that the facts as they really are are not anything near the lies that Sarah Brady and her ilk spew out to the public on a somewhat regular basis. And uh, I find it amazing that Americans, Americans, whose nation was founded by such geniuses, who had built up safeguards in every way that they could to protect us from any kind of tyranny, and who had done it because they had observed the tyranny that occurred on a routine basis in Europe, would even begin to embrace the flawed statistics and the outright lies of the anti-gun lobby, of handgun control incorporated, of rabid socialists like Sarah Brady. I mean, how does that happen? How does it happen when we can see that cities that have completely outlawed gun ownership at all within the 10-mile square area of Washington, D.C. There are more murders and more gun-related crimes than in any place else in the country. Yet they have a total ban on gun ownership of any kind in Washington, D.C. And yet Americans ignore that. In places where it is required that all the citizens own guns, there's very little crime at all. Why? because every criminal knows that they're taking a great risk of being shot if they try to rape a woman who's carrying a gun or break into a house where guns are owned 
or mug someone who is carrying a gun or try to steal the car of someone who carries a gun in their car. That's why. And every year, thousands of lives are saved by responsible gun-owning citizens who use their weapon in self-defense or in the defense of others. Yet you never see those statistics, but they're readily available. I've read them to you on the air here. Instead, you're given phony statistics that when you check them are not even true. Such as the most recent that 186,000 felons were prevented from buying firearms by the Brady Bill. It is an outright lie. And research has shown that most of those turned away were turned away by mistake. Many of them were turned away because law enforcement did not have the time to check the records. Some of them were turned away for misdemeanors, misdemeanors, not felonies. And there is no law against a person who has a misdemeanor from owning a firearm, preventing a person who has a misdemeanor from owning a firearm. If there was, they wouldn't have to worry about gun control. Most of America would already be stripped of their firearms because most Americans sometime in their life have committed a misdemeanor. A traffic ticket, ladies and gentlemen, is a misdemeanor, for gosh sake. I feel so stupid saying for gosh sake because if I wasn't on the radio, it's not anything near what I would say. I was in the Navy. I have a vocabulary that I like to use to fit the situation. Unfortunately, it's not good to do it on the radio. Now, if this continues, ladies and gentlemen, if all of this continues, including the ignorance, apathy, and stupidity of the American people, you're looking at the impending death of the United States of America, our freedom for the world. And... By golly, of all the principles and ideals that made this nation great. You see, we didn't get to this point by accident. We got here because we had certain principles and ideals and privileges and rights, mainly rights. Those rights brought other privileges, so to speak. But you see, we don't have constitutional rights. We have rights that were recognized by the founders of this nation that were given to us by our Creator. They wrote a constitution in the Bill of Rights to protect us from the government taking away or encroaching upon those rights. And then, as a last resort, they gave us the second article in amendment in case the government broke out of its bounds, and indeed became a tyrant. A militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now you can say what all, whatever you want. You can believe whatever you want. You can believe weapons, guns are evil. You can believe that we should do away with them. You can believe that none of us should have the right to carry them, but I'm going to tell you right now. And so you rip the Constitution and the Bill of Rights into a billion pieces and fling them into the wind. You cannot enact any constitutional law restricting the right of the people to keep and bear arms in any manner without breaking the law yourself, for that is the supreme law of the land. unless you want to preside over the funeral of this great nation. This is the Voice of Freedom. Live, shortwave radio, 99.55 kilohertz, Monday through Friday night, 5 until 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is my daddy's station. I'm here, classic radio, like you always wished it could be. 101.1 FM, Eagle. 
101.1 FM is owned and operated by the Independent Foundation Trust as a non-profit community service. Welcome, folks, to the second hour of the uh, hour of the time. Uh, I don't know how I got a second hour to an hour, but uh, I did. This broadcast used to be one hour long, and I did that for, gee, four and a half years. And then we decided to do this network, and I decided to go with two hours of programming, and uh, it's working out so far sort of okay. <laughs> but we're not going to change the name of the broadcast, because it fits. This is the hour of the time, and that introduction is a warning. Because unless we awaken enough of the sheeple and turn things around, that's what you're going to hear in the streets of America. Sirens, and dogs barking, and the tromp, tromp, tromp of the Nazi jackbooted thugs that many Americans have already heard. Not just marching through the streets, but in their living rooms, ripping their homes apart, destroying their lives. As we march closer and closer to the <laughs> to the non-existent New World Order. Oh, it just amazes me when some some ignorant person who thinks because they haven't done any research and haven't seen anything about it that it doesn't exist. What fools these mortals be. Oh, yes. If you are between the ages of 17 and 45... You are a member of the militia, whether you want to be or not. Whether you want to be or not, you are a member of the militia. You are required to keep a weapon and enough ammunition to fight a battle, if you have to. And if you are honorably discharged or retired from any of the branches of the armed forces of the United States of America, you are a member of the militia until age 65, at which time you may elect to bow out, or, if you are still in good health and wish to remain, you may do so. That's the law, ladies and gentlemen. It is the law. It's not something I made up. Ted Koppel never read it, that's for sure. None of the talking heads, the mindless robots of the communist news networks have ever read it. Don't know anything about it. Have not studied the history of this nation. They are tools of the communist socialist machine, the illuminist hierarchy that is destroying this nation. Intentionally, it is no accident. And you had better wake up. You had better learn your responsibilities. You had better learn what the truth is instead of listening and believing all of the lies. And then... Ladies and gentlemen, that was the recruiting bugle. There is a militia in your area that is recruiting constantly. Seek out and join a militia. Seek out and join a militia. If you cannot find a militia in your area, study the law and form your own militia. And be ready to defend our rights our constitutions of our states, the Constitution for the United States of America, and to restore constitutional Republican government, because there will become a day, ladies and gentlemen, when they will come against us in earnest to enslave us in a world totalitarian socialist, what they call utopian government. And unless you like that sort of thing, You'd better get ready to oppose it by every means possible, including the force of arms. Now, I know you don't like to hear that. But it is, nevertheless, the truth. And if you spend your life trying to duck the truth, walking on the fence pole, you're going to be probably obliterated by both sides, or you will turn out to be one of the endless lines of refugees on some road somewhere are a starving beggar in a ditch. And you don't want that to happen. 
You see, if you're not prepared for what is coming, you will be caught bereft of any support, any food, any clothing, any shelter. Now, I'm talking dead serious to you now, ladies and gentlemen. You see, once all of this starts, and it will start, I can assure you, not bought about by any patriots or any militia, I can assure you of that also, but once it starts, all traffic on major interstates and on rail lines will halt. All passenger and cargo traffic other than military will halt. Within three days, all of the food and water and stores in your local grocery stores will be gone. If battles are fought in your area, your home may be burnt to the ground. If you are suspected of aiding or harboring militiamen, your home will be burnt to the ground, you will be arrested, you will be hauled away, and nobody knows what will happen to you. And I want you to think about it. And I want you to think about it hard. And I'm not saying this to frighten you. I'm telling you this so that you may have an opportunity to know it and prepare yourselves, for it is the truth. Most Americans already know this in their heart. They can feel it. They can sense it. They know that some kind of a conflict, a showdown is coming. And I can assure you that if the socialists cling to the tactics of their history, it is not far off. It is not far off at all, ladies and gentlemen. And so you must prepare. One of the ways of preparing is to make sure that you have on hand real money. For in such a societal breakdown, no one, and I mean no one, will accept that funny money that you have in your pocket. If you don't have something that people can recognize instantly as being real money, or unless you have something of value to trade, you will lose your ability to acquire what you need. Nobody's going to want your VCR, folks. Nobody's going to want your television set because there's not going to be any electricity in most places of the country. Not because the militia shuts it off, but because the government will shut it off. But you will be amazed at what will become valuable in such a situation. Things like coffee, tea, Tampex, toilet paper, bullets, guns, blankets, warm clothing, shoes, toothpaste, and not much else. The only money that will be recognized will be gold and silver coin. Nothing else. You can add to the barter list such things as gasoline, diesel fuel, lanterns. Beyond those things, ladies and gentlemen, you'd be hard-pressed to find anything that anybody's going to need or want. And so you had better prepare yourselves accordingly. On Tuesday, January 7th, the 105th Congress convened on Capitol Hill, and soon thereafter, the anti-gun crowd renewed their assault on our rights. This is going to be a banner year for the socialists. If they have their way, most of our rights will disappear within the next two years. Those that we have left, that is. 
Their goal is to usher in the new world order by the year 2000. Prepare to watch the sunset and know that we have prepared our children for the dawn. This is the symbology of the initiates of the mystery religion of Babylon that are destroying this country. Which tells us that William Jefferson Clinton is a highly degreed adept because he speaks the language. He speaks the language. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, Lucifer is the great deceiver and Lucifer is their god. Lucifer is their god. They believe in the Luciferian philosophy. It is a metaphor. The man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust, vindictive, and terrible god. The god of darkness, the god of the Bible, the god of the Christians, Jehovah, Adonai, Yahweh. And that man was set free from this prison by Lucifer through his agent Satan and many say the two are exactly the same and I tend to believe that. By the gift of intellect whereby man discounted God's warning that if ye eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil ye shall surely die. Satan said no. God is lying to you. He's denying you your own divinity, your own destiny. For if you should eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, ye shall become as gods. They have since interpreted it to mean they shall become God. And they have twisted everything and turned it all around upside down and backwards. Where dark is now light and light is now dark. The God of the Bible is now an evil, dark, unjust, vindictive God. And Lucifer is the savior of the world. Lucifer, whom they say in all of their writings is the bright and morning star. They say that that's what the Bible says. And ladies and gentlemen, if you understand the esoteric language, and remember I've told you this before on many occasions, that the Bible is written in two languages, one exoteric and one esoteric. Every priest knows this. Every doctor of theology knows this, but they will never tell it to you because that is forbidden. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Lucifer is Prometheus, the lightning bolt that hit the tree and brought the gift of fire to man. Fire being the symbol for the intellect, the ability to think. With the use of the fire by the philosophers of fire, man himself will become God. Son of the morning? What is the sun of the morning? What is the morning? The morning is the dawn, the rising of the sun, spelled S-U-N. But the S-U-N, rising in the morning, at the dawn, the golden dawn, is also the sun, S-O-N, the son of Osiris, Horus. The sun, spelled S-U-N, is the bright and morning star. And Osiris is the dawn, the sun, the light, Lucifer. Many people make the mistake that they understand or know what they're talking about when they try to pick up on what they've heard about the symbology of the mysteries. And I'm here to tell you, unless you've studied it for 20 years like I have, you haven't got a chance of knowing what you're talking about. So be very careful. Be very, very careful. Now, this is all twisted, of course. And you could get a better idea of exactly what they're talking about if you read the interview conducted by Richard Noon in the book called 5 5 2000. 5 5 2000. 
It's the name of the book by Richard Noon, N-O-O-N-E, in which he conducts an interview with one of the highest adepts of the mystery religion of Babylon. His name is Tom Valentine. And in this interview, he explains much of it and ends by telling you that Jesus Christ is out. He's had his turn and he failed. Now it is his brother Lucifer's turn. And Lucifer will mount the throne of the world. How many of you followed Tom Valentine for so many years not understanding who and what he really is? I hope you wake up, ladies and gentlemen. It is still not too late. But if you remain in that deep slumber for which you are famous, <laughs> it will not only be too late, it will be all over. Is that what you want? I don't think so. For some reason, I just don't think that's what you want. If you do want it, I am sure, I am certain in my heart that you have been deceived. How many of you know about uh, Senators Barbara Boxer, Democrat of California, and Dick Durbin, Democrat of Illinois' latest gun ban? that they have introduced into Congress. Called the American Handgun Standards Act of 1997. Now don't be fooled, Senator Boxer is giving a fancy title to her 1996 junk guns bill. The bill seeks to ban inexpensive, easily concealable guns made of inferior materials that they also claim are the criminal's gun of choice. <laughs> now, if this latter tagline has a familiar ring to it, it is because Boxer, Durbin, and their ilk were touting so-called assault weapons as the criminal's gun of choice, despite the fact that the Clinton gun ban has had no effect on criminals. The anti-gunners are again using this catchy phrase to describe the latest class of firearms on their ban list, handguns. <laughs> And then what will come is no surprise to gun owners. Representative Charles Schumer, Democrat, New York, intends to introduce Boxer's bill in the House of Representatives. While the anti-gunners may have worked for center stage this week, look for pro-gunners to grab the spotlight when Congress gets leaned on. Because i got to tell you, more and more Americans are catching on to this stuff. Not near enough, ladies and gentlemen. Not near enough. There has been a bill introduced by Representative Cliff Stearns for a national right to carry. Reciprocity bill. That's a tongue tire. Now let me tell you something. As long as the states insist that you can't carry a gun, or to carry a gun you have to have a concealed carry permit, or whatever it is that they're restricting you to that you're going along with that's unconstitutional on its face to begin with, that you should never allow. And you don't have to allow it. See, all you have to do is kick all of those jerks out of your state house and out of your state legislature and say, uh-uh, you screwed up. Go back to the farm, Joe. Go back to your dealership, Joe. Go back wherever the hell you came from, but you're not representing us anymore. And you don't have to wait for elections to do that. Many states have other means. You can have a referendum or a recall. Or you can just really get down and dirty and do some real good detective work and I bet you you can come up with enough dirt on any one of them to force them to resign on their own. You want to bet on that? I'll bet you. You see, we already have the right to carry, to keep and bear arms. It's in the Constitution. It's known in the second article in amendment. And the Supreme Court, in ruling after ruling after ruling, has upheld the right of the people to keep and bear arms. They put a militia bent on it in some of these cases. But 
If you're between 17 and 45, what do you care? You're a member of the militia. Well, what do you care? You should care because it applies to all citizens. You see, people, the word people, in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights has been interpreted in every single instance to mean every single citizen. Bar none by every court in the land except where it says people in the second article in amendment. You see, but they can't be because in the law, unless otherwise specified in the law, if it means one thing in one clause of the Constitution or in one article, it means the same in every other article and every other clause. That's the way the law works. If it didn't work that way, then one judge in Illinois could say that it means one thing, another judge in uh, Kentucky could say that it meant something entirely different, and another judge in Washington, D.C. could make up his own meaning for it, that it only means water guns or rubber band guns are little guns that fire harmless foam rubber pellets. Or one judge could say it means atomic weapons. Couldn't he? That's why it must mean the same everywhere all the time. They could interpret people to mean only children. Or only those citizens over 80 years old. Or only... Those in the military forces. You see what I mean? It must have the same meaning everywhere. And everyone must recognize what that meaning is. Or else. If we don't all understand what we're talking about, you have what is known as chaos. It isn't that really what they're aiming for. Chaos. Chaos, chaos, chaos. Did you know that Charles Schumer, one of the most despicable men that has ever lived upon the face of this earth, is a Democrat from New York, is thinking of running for governor? Oh, this is amazing. He's thinking of actually running for governor. And you know, in the state in which he lives, he just might get elected. And if he does, everybody who lives in that state is in big trouble, but at least we'd get him out of the national scene. We'd get him out of Congress, and that's important. We've got to get Schumer out of Congress. He should never be allowed in any office, not even dog catcher. I feel sorry for the dogs. If Schumer was the dog catcher, he'd take away their claws. Yep, every dog in town would have to be caught, held down, strapped to a table, while their claws were pulled out with a pair of pliers. And then he'd want to pull all their teeth so that they uh, wouldn't be able to defend themselves or harm anybody. <laughs> That's the way Schumer thinks. Schumer is one of the biggest liars that's ever lived on the face of this earth. He is slimy, as a matter of fact. Like, have you ever boiled okra? Well, that's Charles Schumer. Boil some okra on the stove, then reach in and try to pick up one of those okra pods. If you can pick it up, they're so slimy you probably won't be able to, but pick it up. That's Charles Schumer. Slimy. He's not scum, ladies and gentlemen, he's sludge. Scum close to the top, sludge stays on the bottom. Sludge is where all the rotting and stinking and crap takes place. That's Representative Charles Schumer. Schumer has been involved in every attack against legitimate, law-abiding, gun-owning citizens in this country. He has viciously attacked patriots and militias, spouting lie after lie after lie after lie. He blamed militias for the downing of TWA Flight 800. And nobody knows to this day. Of 
what they're finally going to arrive at is the reason why that plane crashed. We know why it crashed. Somebody fired a missile at it and hit it. We've already proven that. It's beyond any shadow of a doubt at all. Have no problem winning in any court of law. Convincing any jury. It's a done deal. But it wasn't the militia and it wasn't any patriot. I can assure you of that. See, we don't have anti-aircraft missiles or ships big enough to fire anti-aircraft missiles from that would hit an aircraft at that altitude. We're not talking about stinger missiles on your shoulder. We're talking about big, long, surface-to-air missiles called SAMs. They are photographs of it in flight. AT&T says it does not take a position on gun control one way or the other. <laughs> you see, AT&T gave a $3 million donation to the Coalition for America's Children, some of whose leaders are also leaders of Handgun Control Incorporated. It's a coalition organization made up of 350 nonprofit organizations focused on improving the lot of children in America. According to AT&T, the coalition does not endorse any legislation or legislative proposal. But some of the leaders of the coalition hold views in support of gun control. And what do you think, folks? Well... I know what I think. I think a little music is in order. And now you know why William Jefferson Clinton in a White House memo named me, William Cooper, as the most dangerous radio host in America. Because I tell you the truth. A lot of the truth I tell you is what you're already thinking, but I haven't got the guts to vocalize. I hope to change all that. Swiss America Trading at 1-800-289-2646. So ask for a copy of the latest newsletter. Tell them that you're a steady listener to the hour of the time. With William Cooper, you'll get red carpet treatment, I guarantee it. Also, thank them for sponsoring this broadcast. But without their sponsorship, you probably would never hear it. While you're at it, ask how you can get your hands on some real money, gold and silver coins. The only thing that might save you in the coming conflict. And it is coming. 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-289-2646. Or, if it's easier to remember, 1-800-BUY-CORN. How many of you knew that the United Nations built on United States soil in New York. In New York City, as a matter of fact, how many of you knew that the United Nations has built a huge statue on its grounds? A huge, tremendous, big statue of a pistol with a knot tied in the barrel. Yes, this is the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen. Do you think they're advertising gun control to Afghanistan? 
<laughs> with a statue in New York City? No, not at all. It's a political statement for American citizens to ban guns. It is a huge, gigantic statue of a pistol with a knot tied in the barrel. The United Nations is the heart and soul of the New World Order One World Government. It's already a done deal, and I've proven that to you with documentation on this broadcast. It's not a supposition. It's not a proposition. It's not illusion. It's not imagination. It's a fact. They just haven't told you about it. You see, they're easing in us into it slowly. A little at a time, taking away a little at a time. How many of you really believe that the National Rifle Association is on your side, fighting in your favor to keep and bear arms? Well, if you do, you're sadly mistaken. You see, in all of its history, the National Rifle Association has claimed that they never allow anyone to see the membership list. And if government were to ask for it, they would deny them access to that list. Yet, did you know, ladies and gentlemen, during all those years, anybody, anybody could purchase the mailing list of the National Rifle Association for $75? You didn't know that, did you? Well, it's the truth. Do you know how many times the National Rifle Association has cost us gun rights by compromising? There is no compromise. A militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Not even a little bit. They have no right negotiating on anything. They have no right negotiating on what they will accept as a gun law or what they will not accept as a gun law. The Constitution makes it clear. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. When the state of California, or I should say the people of the state of California, had a referendum to place the second article in amendment as an amendment to the Constitution of the state of California, the National Rifle Association fought against it and helped to defeat it. How many of you were aware of that? How many of you are aware that the National Rifle Association is helping to destroy the sovereignty of the United States of America. They have recognized the United Nations. In fact, they have joined that organization. You know what they say? Marching in lockstep with anti-gun foreign powers, the Clinton-Gore administration continues to promote gun control on a global scale. The National Rifle Association, through its newly won status within the United Nations, will keep American gun owners well informed on these misguided plans. We don't want to be well informed. We don't want anything to do with those misguided plans. We do not want to give any recognition whatsoever to the authority over us or over the NRA or over the United States government or over any part of us in any manner whatsoever by the United Nations. By joining the United Nations, the National Rifle Association has admitted their power and authority, has bowed to that power and authority, and has become a member of that body. Do you know that when you become a member of the body, you have to agree to certain things, and certain members must take an oath to the United Nations, renouncing any oath or oaths they may have taken ever in their history to their country and must pledge to work only in support of the United Nations and not the country of their birth or their origin or their citizenship. Did you know that? If you don't believe it, write the State Department to Madeleine Albright. Ask for a copy of the oath that she took while she was the representative for the United States to the United Nations. 
or write to the current representative whom I don't know who that is right now. We may not even have one right now. I don't know. I haven't really paid attention to that. Did anybody in the NRA have to take such an oath? I don't know. But I think we should find out, don't you? But even if they didn't, what is the NRA doing joining the, the, the United Nations? They joined the United Nations as a non-governmental organization of the United Nations. Which means the National Rifle Association represents the United Nations. They're a member. Don't tell me they don't represent the United Nations. To be a member, you must. You must. To be a Boy Scout, you must represent the Boy Scouts. If you're a member of the Chamber of Commerce, you represent the Chamber of Commerce. Don't tell me they don't. Because I'll tell you, you're full of crap up to your ears. Again. They have betrayed us. Over and over and over again. You see, all those years they were telling us that they would never make the membership list available to anybody who asked for it. They knew that anybody who wanted to purchase the mailing list for the NRA, which includes the entire membership, could get it for $75. They knew that. Now you know it. Now we all know it. Everybody knows it. <laughs> what do you think about it? You think it's just a fluke? We should ignore it? Why is the NRA concerned about what the rest of the world is doing? Who cares what the rest of the world is doing to their citizens? If their citizens allow it, they deserve it. The NRA is supposed to represent us here in this country. Listen to what they say. This is written by Tanya Metaxa, by the way. You know, the little cream puff that claims to be representing our right to keep and bear arms. Doesn't even know the purpose of the militia. Doesn't know the law concerning the militia. Never takes a stance supporting the militia. Or the real purpose to keep and bear arms, which is to protect the American people from a tyrannical government. Apparently, she's never read any of the writings of the Founding Fathers, or she would know all of that. But this little cutesy tootsie, listen to this. As the second Clinton-Gore administration begins, it's become clearer than ever before that anti-gun activism knows no boundaries. In Great Britain, a wave of national hysteria is likely to lead to a ban on virtually all handguns. In Australia, gun owners are already turning in their firearms for destruction. And at the United Nations, both crime prevention officials and disarmament activists are studying gun control as an international issue. The Clinton administration isn't just sitting on the sidelines either. Clinton is recently retired ambassador to Japan, former vice president and presidential candidate Walter Mondale, followed the Japanese line on the gun issue, saying in a speech that failure to restrict the use of guns as weapons of wanton bloodshed is no longer just a domestic issue. It shatters our moral authority. Meanwhile, Clinton's trade representatives continue to push for more countries to follow Russia's lead in signing voluntary restraint agreements, blocking the export of their firearms to the U.S., What's NRA doing to stop the world anti-gun agenda? To represent the unique freedom of the American gun owner, to champion our national birthright of firearms ownership, and to keep NRA members informed of UN activities, NRA sought and won approval from the United Nations as an accredited non-governmental organization. Unlike the Congress or your state legislature, where you as an individual have the opportunity to visit legislators, attend hearings, and watch floor debates, only governments and accredited non-governmental organizations have the ability to observe many UN activities and give their input to saying, Who cares? 
If the United Nations passes a resolution tomorrow that all Americans will turn in their guns, I'm not going to turn my gun in, are you? And do you think they're going to listen to the NRA? And do you think I give a damn about what happens in Great Britain? Do their guns? No. I don't. Never have and never will. Those people have a right to determine their own future. It's none of my business. And what we do here in this country is none of theirs. And what we do in this country is certainly none of the business of the United Nations. That is, if the Constitution is still in effect. But, of course, I've shown you how that has been done away with already. The truth is, we're already under a world government under the United Nations. But only if we accept it as such. For those in power in Washington throughout the years have given an erroneous interpretation to Article 6 of the Constitution. And I say erroneous and mean every single letter of that word erroneous. For if the founding fathers, if the founding fathers wrote the Constitution, ladies and gentlemen, then put Article 6 in so that any president and Senate acting of their own accord could destroy it within two weeks by making a treaty with a foreign country, if you really believe that they did that, then you've got to screw loose. They wouldn't have done that in a million years. You see, what Article 6 intends is that any treaty made that is in conformance with the Constitution for the United States of America then becomes a part of the law of the land. But because it doesn't say that in there, because it's implied and should be understood, they interpret that any treaty entered into, no matter what the treaty says, that President Clinton could enter into a treaty tomorrow according to the way they interpret Article 6, they could have a treaty entered into tomorrow with communist China that calls for the extermination of all of the members of the Mormon Church. And if the Senate ratifies it, it then becomes the supreme law of the land and supersedes the Constitution. So you never thought of it that way, did you? They could do the same thing for Catholics. They could pass a treaty, they could sign a treaty, and the Senate could ratify it tomorrow. But said all automobiles in the United States are po polluting the atmosphere of the entire world. And therefore, the world body and all the nations of the United Nations have entered into this treaty to do away with all gasoline-powered automobiles within two weeks. They must all be confiscated and crushed. Is that constitutional? No, of course not. But according to their interpretation of Article 6, they can do it. And many of the laws that they have passed, the treaties that they have entered into, are exactly that kind of thing. Only not with cars, Mormons, or Catholics. They're with our rights, our creator-endowed rights, our sovereignty, our borders, our ability to defend ourselves. You see, we are deep into it. So deeply into it that we've reached the point that I believe that if by some miracle we could awaken the vast numbers of American people, we could turn it around. But I'm also realistic enough to know that we're not even going to approach waking up that many people because most people won't even listen to the truth, much less go check it out to make sure that it is the truth. And then they won't do anything about it. Many of you listening to this broadcast have been listening for years. You know what the truth is. You've gone out and looked it up. You know that we're telling you the truth, yet you still sit on your couch and do nothing. Nothing except listen to the radio. Nothing. Pass rumor back and forth. Pretend to be a patriot. Truth is, 
They're just sheeple. Some people justify they do by saying, well, I went along with this because it's the lesser of two evils. The lesser of two evils is still evil. A vote for evil is a vote for evil. Whether it's lesser or greater, it is evil. Whether it's a vote, a decision, acceptance by passivity. You see, you can disagree, dislike, hate something, be totally against it, but if you never open your mouth and say anything, you have accepted it. Because you have been passive. The basis of all law is that if you do not claim your rights, and defend them to the death, you are not entitled to any rights. It's always been the basis of all of the law. It's where the law comes from. You see, there can be no law without force of law. What is the force of law? It's the barrel of a gun, ladies and gentlemen. A long time ago, it was the point of a sword or the tip of a spear. Or the guy that could throw the biggest rock the farthest. Whoever could do that could dictate the law. Now, well, that could never happen in America because we decide the law by, by democratic process. Bull This was never intended to be a democratic process. It's a constitutional republic. The only democratic part of it is you get to elect your representatives. You were never supposed to be able to re elect these senators. They were supposed to be appointed by the legislature of the states. That was one of the biggest blows against us, was making the senators elected by the public. But even still, they're not elected by the public. You can vote as much as you want. And they put up the popular vote and everybody thinks that guy won. But the truth is, the electors are the who, who decide. And the electors can go against the public vote. Everybody was touting that Clinton had won the election when the electors had not even met and voted. And it's not over until they do. Fortunately for Clinton, they supported the popular vote, but they don't have to. You see, our founding fathers put all kinds of checks and balances into this system. And we've managed to do away with a lot of those. And we've managed by our apathy, ignorance, and outright stupidity to destroy some of them and assist in the own destruction of many of our freedoms and rights. And there's going to be even bigger and badder attacks upon our freedoms and upon our rights for the remainder of this year and into 1998. And sometime between now and the year 2000, there will be a terrible conflict. Because that's their goal. 2000, New World Order. You heard Clinton say it himself. Think he's lying to you? Well, most of the things out of his mouth are lies except for that, folks. You can take that to the bank. To the bank. That good. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to do anything or are you going to sit around and complain? You know, I warned people in 1988 that part of the goal of the New World Order was to deprive ranchers and farmers of grazing land, and that in the New World Order, when it's finally instituted, eating beef will be politically incorrect and, in fact, is scheduled to become outlawed. And there is a tremendous movement now. See, I was telling people back in 1988 this was going to happen. And now it's happening. Tremendous movement to strip the grazing land from the ranchers and from the farmers and to seriously damage or even destroy, which is the ultimate goal, the beef industry. And a lot of ranchers and farmers have been seriously injured. 
by what has gone on. They intend to remove all use of all forests from human hands, from human beings. We've seen their plans. We've seen their maps. They're going to have areas of non-human occupation, which means no human being will be allowed under penalty of the law to even step one foot inside of these areas. They will have areas of human occup occupation. And in between these areas of human occupation, they will have corridors for travel. You'll not be able to go outside of these corridors. And there will be a limited amount of land designated for recreational use. But recreational use to these people means simply paths, walkways, for bicycles and hikers. You cannot step off the path. You cannot pick anything. You cannot pick up a rock. You cannot stop to camp unless they build a campsite for you to use. And then you have to stay in that campsite. No more walks out into the virgin woods. And you'll have to apply for the use of these areas years in advance. Because the use will be so limited and there will be so many people who will want to use these lands. But if you get to use them twice in your lifetime or maybe three times, you'll be very lucky. All this is coming to a theater near you. <laughs> oh, yes. It is. Whatever happened to the great American resolve? It used to be Americans knew who they were, what they were about, what we believed in, what we cared about. How many of you don't know those things anymore? Or maybe were never taught those things or somewhere along the line forgot them. How many of you have never read the Constitution for the United States of America in your life? And as such, don't even know what your rights are. Don't understand or know the supreme law of the land. You've got some vague idea about separation of church and state, which is not in the Constitution, or about freedom of speech. And you're not even sure what that means, are you? Well, it's true, folks. It is true. I go all across this land and I talk to a lot of people. And I know that it's true. It is so true. It is so overwhelmingly sad and true. It is amazing. It is absolutely amazing that this is occurring in this country. The greatest nation on the first incident of the freedom of humankind. The built the greatest nation in the history of the world. Good night. And God bless each and every single one of you. And may God in His infinite mercy save this republic. A week before the Battle of Bull Run, Sullivan Ballou, a major in the 2nd Rhode Island Volunteers, wrote home to his wife in Smithfield. July the 14th, 1861, Washington, D.C. Dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. Unless I should not be able to write you again, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eye when I am no more. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not fall for falter. I know how American civilization now leans upon the triumph of the government, and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life 
to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to find me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence can break. And yet my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly with all those chains to the battlefield. The memory of all the blissful moments I've enjoyed with you come crowding over me. And I feel most deeply grateful to God and you that I've enjoyed them for so long. And how hard it is for me to give them up and burn to ashes the hopes of future years. And God willing, we might still have lived and loved together and see our boys grown up to honorable manhood around us. If I do not return, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I loved you. Nor that when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. Forgive my many faults and the many pains I have caused you. How thoughtless, how foolish I have sometimes been. But oh, Sarah, the dead can come back to this earth, and if there's unseen around those they love, I shall always be with you in the brightest day and the darkest night. Always. Always. And when the soft breeze fans your cheek, it shall be my breath. The cool air of your throbbing temple, it shall be my spirit passing by. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think I am gone. And wait for me, or we shall meet again. Sullivan Ballou was killed a week later at the first battle of Bull Run. Ladies and gentlemen, Sullivan Ballou was an American patriot, and the government of which he was so fond that he gave his life, is the Constitution for the United States of America and the Bill of Rights, which formed this most perfect union. Not what you perceive to be the government today. This is the voice of freedom. <laughs>